What's going on, Thrive Market friends and family? It's Josh. And today I am going to take you through a tasting of our winter bundle. It's a tasting and a bundle I'm really excited about. We've got a little central Italian dance off between one of our most popular wines uh, that we've had on site since the inception of our wine program, a really great Tuscan red. Then we'll scoot over to Abruzzo on the Adriatic coast. We'll jump from there over to both South America and Spain for a couple of really cool reds. And then we have a white and sparkling because what would a winter bundle be without a little sparkling wine? And I know a lot of times we start with white and sparkling, but today I'm just feeling particularly jazzed about our red wines. And I think it'll be nice to uh, finish off with the sparkling wine and the spirit of, of whatever holidays you celebrate and, and New Year's coming up. So we're going to start here with the Santa Lucia Toscano Rosso. And today I'm going to take the opportunity to not only go through the wines, but also just tell you a little bit about the background of some of these regions and some of these grapes you might not be that familiar with. And um, hopefully we can learn a couple things together while we drink some tasty wine. So you'll notice right away that on this wine, you've got the region of Tuscany, Toscano Rosso, and then you have two grapes here. You've got Sangiovese and Cilegiolo. Cilegiolo is a lot of fun to say, and it's a grape you rarely see. Even, a, even in the world of wacky Italian varietals and things like that, Sangiovese is a grape that's very popular. It's the most widely grown red grape throughout the country of Italy. It makes Chianti, Chianti Classico, a specific type of Sangiovese. It makes a very famous wine called Brunello and Rosso de Montalcino. So this is a grape that you can find whether or not your bottle of wine actually says Sangiovese, as in this case, or just has the kind of regulated place name like Chianti. Sangiovese is out there uh, and you'll see it quite frequently. Cilegiolo, however, Cilegiolo is a grape that historically has found its way into the blends of Chianti, Chianti Classico and Tuscany for many, many, many generations. And really the tradition and history of Tuscany and Tuscan wine is as a blended wine. It's not similar to a wine from Australia, like Shiraz, here it is. It's Shiraz, says on the label, it's all Shiraz. California, Cabernet, that's what it is. The origins of Tuscan wine um, really go back to when the, the wealthy landowners who lived in Florence and, and major cities around had their kind of country estates, which were managed by the farmers who lived on the land. And the agriculture practiced on those country estates was what's called promiscuous agriculture. You had olives, you have nuts, you have grains, you have grapes, and all sorts of different kinds of grapes. And the farmers did their best to coax the maximum bounty from these grapevines and this agricultural estate so that they could be paid well and that the wealthy people in the cities would kind of have the 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 fruit of their land, so to speak. And rather than having one particular varietal, they weren't really concerned with that. They were concerned of a they were concerned just with blending things together and making a delicious wine. So that's a little bit about the origin of the history of blending and things like that you'll find throughout Tuscany. And, and while this Cilegiolo grape might not be something you've ever seen before, and I can only think of two or three unique Cilegiolo bottlings I've seen in 25 years, um, this really isn't that unusual of a blend. 70 or 80% Sangiovese is really what's been making Chianti and Chianti Classico uh, in the modern era, and then it's just kind of blended with friends that are that are allowed to be grown in the Tuscan vineyards. One of the things you'll notice about this wine is that it kind of got a little bit of kind of a low intensity of color, right? You can kind of look through it. You can read through it. It's not kind of an inky, big, bold Malbec or Cabernet or anything like that. And that's because Sangiovese, which is three quarters of this wine in particular, doesn't have that thick of a skin and doesn't have that much pigment in the skin. So when you're making wine, 99.9% .9 of wine grapes that are grown around the world, the juice is clear. So how does your red wine get red? And this is a really interesting thing to think about. So in the process of when your wine, this grape juice is becoming wine, it's fermenting, it's aging, it's doing all the things that turns grape juice into wine, your skins from the grape are gonna be in contact with this clear juice. 
It's kind of like doing laundry, which is the way I like to teach about it because we can all relate to that. Think about throwing a bunch of brand new purple sweatshirts into your laundry with some lighter colored laundry. You're really going to color your white clothing quite purple, as opposed to throwing in some t-shirts, some thinner fabric, not so much rich, maybe it's a lighter colored purple, into the laundry with those same white clothes, and they'll get a little pink. So Sangiovese is one of those lighter colored purple t-shirt grapes, as opposed to Cabernet or Malbec or Syrah or something with a lot of pigment and color in the skin. And that's why your wine is a little bit of a lighter color, like Pinot Noir, for example, or something like that. So aromatically, I think one of the reasons this wine has been so fantastically successful for us is that it just jumps out of the glass with freshness. It's vibrant. It's bright. It has really relatable kind of strawberry and red cherry and, and just raspberry and these bright, fresh flavors uh, aromatically to the wine. And in, in, you know, on the palate is what I say when you, when you taste the wine. On the palate, it's just kind of encroaching on medium body. It's got a little bit of kind of like a zesty texture to the wine, which either refreshes your palate or maybe gets you ready for a bite of pasta or gets you ready for a bite of chicken or vegetables or something like this. Uh, it's aged entirely in stainless steel, which is one of the ways that the wine retrain, um, kind of keeps and retains this freshness and unadulterated kind of fruit natural driven flavor. And I think that's one of the things that makes the wine so versatile at the table. So it's not oaky or vanilla or chard or chocolatey or anything like that. It's just fresh, bright, just on the edge of medium body and crisp and refreshing. Another thing that I love about this wine is made entirely from organic grapes. Actually, all the wines in this bundle are made entirely from organic grapes. And this estate in particular, um, they do wonderful things in terms of managing the animals on the estate and um, planting different crops besides grapes. And there's certain, it's a hunting sanctuary at times for hares and rabbits and, and things like this so that you know nature has a way to coexist with, the, with, with itself. So it's really kind of a beautiful story, a beautiful place, and you can really kind of feel that in the wine. So that's a little bit about the Toscana Rosso from Santa Lucia and a little bit about Tuscany, Sangiovese, and Cilegiolo. Moving on to the second red wine, we're just going to take a little bit of a trip. We're going to drive for a few hours over to the Adriatic coast. So another Italian red wine, and that's going to be the Fonte Barco Montepulciano di Abruzzo. Uh, again, another wine made from entirely organically grown grapes. You'll, you'll hear that a lot in this bundle. Um, and the first thing we need to clear up here, for those of us who, who like Italian wine or, or may know a little bit more about it than some others, Montepulciano is a word that you're going to hear in a couple of different places and a couple of different ways throughout Italian wine. There is a Tuscan wine, Vino Nobile de Montepulciano, which is entirely different, made from entirely different grapes and from an entirely different region than this Montepulciano di Abruzzo. Abruzzo is a wild region on the Adriatic coast of Italy. Um, it has two of the most magnificent national parks, uh, the Gran Sasso and the Maiella National Parks. It's it's um, wolves and bears and, and camping and fantastic place to go on if anybody likes camping or motorcycle uh, uh, tours and things like this. It's just a magnificent region in Italy that on one hand is known for mass production, uh, big boxes of multiple Chiano di Abruzzo and, 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 and kind of mediocre white wines made from, um, from a grape named Trebbiano and a few others. And then there are some people who are taking this Montepulciano grape, reducing the yields, making wine with a little bit more ambition, and ending up with a wine like this, which especially coming off of the Toscana Rosso made from Sangiovese and Cilegiolo, you'll notice immediately there's a little bit of a kind of a more of a purple ruby color to the wine, and it's a little bit more difficult to see through. Montepulciano, a little bit more towards a sweatshirt, kind of like a medium 
medium weight sweatshirt, while Sangiovese is a little bit more like the t-shirt, like the Pinot Noir. So you have a thicker skinned grape here with a little bit more pigment to it. And that is going to result in the color and the aroma just immediately you go from those kind of strawberries and raspberries in the first wine to these kind of black plums and blackberries and black cherries in the aromas of this wine. And it's just a little bit of a darker profile on the nose. On the palate, this wine is firmly rooted in a medium body. Now, in addition to body, I always think it's important to talk about texture of a wine. And generally, when we're thinking about a wine, uh, what we want to drink, or when we want to drink, and why we might want to pair it, or why we want to pull a specific wine at a certain time, you have a, you're thinking about, oh, do I want something light, medium, or full? And, and do I want something kind of soft and round, or do I want something with a little bit more of a grip to it? And Montepulciano has a little bit of the kind of texture that dries your mouth out a little bit. That's uh, something in the wine that's called tannin. It's kind of, you get a little bit of this. It's not austere. It's not overly aggressive. It's not going to make you feel like you just got socked in the face by a, by a glass of red wine, but there's a medium body to it. And it just has a little bit extra uh, tannin up here and a little bit of extra acidity on the sides that really make it a phenomenal, phenomenal accompaniment to all sorts of different types of foods. It just might be one of those wines where you say, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you save this for when you actually have some food on the table or you're in the mood for something that has a little bit more of that kind of presence and weight on the palate to it. It's a great wine to drink by itself if you like things on a little bit of a textured side of medium. And again, you have a dark fruited wine. It's not overwhelmed by oak. Um, but it has a little bit more of that kind of um, developed aged uh, profile that you'll get when something is aged for a little while in, in, in smoke barrels. It's not a wine that's hit too hard with new oak or anything like that, but it has a little bit of the impact of that. So the Fonte Barco, Montepulciano di Abruzzo, made entirely from organic grapes, uh, medium bodied red with dark fruit, and a little bit of an extra texture there to either go with food or for those of you looking for something that sticks around a little bit on the palate. So now we're gonna jump away from Italy and we're gonna hit on an interesting red and that's the Grey Zorro Carmenere. And <clears throat> Carmenere is an interesting grape, um, Carmenere right here. So Carmenere is an interesting grape with a little bit of a funny history, especially when it comes to, to Chile, its origins in Chile. This is a Chilean wine. And this particular example is from really the premier growing region in Chile, the Maipo. Um, so there's a lot of kind of communication between Chile and France in the 1800s and Bordeaux. The Chileans were sending people to learn a little bit about how to make wine and things like that and coming back to, to do it themselves. This isn't a wine industry that was um, developed by colonists or colonization or anything like that, or people bringing things over to Chile. This was a home team and they were sending people out to learn a little bit and who better to learn from than the French and particularly the Bordelais in Bordeaux in the middle of the 19th century. So the Chileans were traveling around, they learned a lot, and there was this grape, Carmenere, which did very well in Bordeaux. People loved it. It added this kind of lushness, dark fruit, and savory profile to the wines, but it was a little bit of a pain to grow. And the Bordeaux climate kind of brought out some of the weaknesses in the grape. There were some kind of issues with mildew and fungus, and it was a little bit of a pain. And as things evolved in France, the Carmenere grape kind of fell out of favor in the Bordeaux region. However, in Chile, they were bringing over Carmenere and Merlot to plant in their vineyards. What they didn't realize, however, is that almost all of the grapes they were bringing over were Carmenere, where most of the Chileans until recently thought they were farming and making Merlot. And then one day there were a couple of French people walking through the vineyards with some Chileans and Chileans said, hey, we're going to go show you um, the Carmenere. Here it is. And the French people said, no, this is Merlot. Where's where's the, where, what's going on? So they did some DNA research and they realized that so much of what they thought was Merlot was actually Carmenere. Um, so this particular wine uh, is not only made from organic grapes, but it comes from a uh, carbon neutral winery, which is pretty cool. 
And you'll notice it's got kind of a, you know, medium color to it. Not much, you know, can't really read through it, but you can kind of see through it. Not really occupying one end of the bookcase or spectrum or another. And on the nose, it's a really interesting wine because you have really these not only kind of appealing dark fruits similar to let's say Merlot or maybe a Merlot blended with a little Cabernet or something like that, but you also have these really um, secondary savory notes of um, maybe some herbs and just wild savory things depending on how your kind of head gets to those things that are kind of beyond fruit and it really adds an, an appealing complexity to the wine and, and also really adds to the pairability of this wine whether you're putting it with vegetarian cuisine or um, some vegetables that are grilled or or done with some really kind of serious spices and seasonings and things like that or you want to pair a red wine against some some kind of stews or roasts or something coming off a grill because on one hand you have these kind of really fun savory terrestrial elements that are popping out of this wine which kind of match up against some of the initial things i mentioned there but at the same time they can also contrast with some chars and roasts and ribs and stews and things like that so one way or the other you're going to find kind of this wine do a couple of different things based on what's next to it, whether it be an additional wine on the table or your food. On the palate, I think one of the really things that sticks out to me about this wine is the softness. And one of the hallmarks of Merlot, with which Carmenere was confused for many years in Chile, one of the reasons that Merlot is so popular, it's soft, it's round, it's lush it with luscious without being too weighty. And this wine really knocks that particular profile out of the park. So you have some kind of plum and dark fruit to the wine. You have this added complexity from these savory elements. And you just have an incredibly soft, easy drinkable wine. Um, very simple and easy to drink without food. Maybe it's that bottle of wine you pop while you're cooking and it just kind of keeps going and going through dinner until it's gone. Or maybe it's that wine that you serve when a bunch of friends are coming over uh, and you've got a bunch of people who are just kind of nibbling and snacking or just, you know, just having a bottle of red wine for no reason at all. And really fantastic, again, with kind of charred, smoky meats from a grill or barbecue and things like that. Every kind of everything you put this wine up against is going to bring out another profile. So that's a little bit about, again, the um, organically grown, carbon neutral Grey Zorro Carmener from Maipo, Chile. So cheers. Our last red of the day, or the bundle, I should say, is another organically grown grape and wine from Spain. It's the Cibolo Monastrel. And Monastrel is a synonym for the Morvedra grape. And the Morvedra grape is grown throughout the world in places that are sunny and warm, but at the same time, aren't extraordinarily dry. This is a little bit of, um, uh, of a region where it is a little bit on the dry side, but it's not necessarily a grape that kind of functions in the same way that Grenache does, although it's, it's awfully close. Um, Morvedra in Southern France, in Provence, in chateauneuf de pape in the Rhone, is this synonym for this grape in, in um, Spain? It's called Monastrel. You'll also hear it called Mataro. And Morvedra Monastrel is a thick skinned grape. Uh, it produces kind of age worthy, dark fruited, sun drenched styles of wine, which also have an affinity for oak. All of those things uh, really make your resulting wine happy to go into an oak barrel. It's not a delicate wine by any stretch of the imagination or anything like that. And in addition to finding this grape in Australia, California, southern France, you'll find it throughout Spain, particularly in the southeast. And the region that we're looking at here is Humilla, which is this word right down at the bottom, Humilla, right here. And this particular area is known for producing, oh, there it is again. This particular region is known for producing kind of benchmark Morvedra wines from Spain. And the reason is because you just have the copious amounts of sunshine and warm weather that allow the Morvedra grape to achieve 
those ripe the, the ripeness that it needs and all of those characteristics I just mentioned. So if you look at it, it's certainly got a, maybe the darkest color thus far of any of the wines we've tried together in this bundle. The nose immediately hits me, particularly after drinking the Carmenere and after the Toscana Rosso. These fruits, the aromatics in this wine, they are sun drenched. They are dark. They're ripened on the vine. There is nothing bashful or nothing kind of on the margin of ripeness about these grapes. They have, they, they have just basked in the sun all season long there. You know, Morvedra you, or Monastrel, you could say, really loves the beach, for example. It loves going to the coast. It loves the sun. And the wine is delicious on its own. Again, it's got these unbridled, deep, rich fruit notes. And that's one of the reasons it kind of occupies a bookend in this bundle. It's not an overtly textured or tannic wine. It does have a little bit of extra weight to it. It is the fullest red in this bundle. I'd put it somewhere in kind of the medium to fuller bodied world. However, it retains a softness and a roundness. It's not austere. It's not gritty. It doesn't make you... You know, it, it's not an assault on my palate that someone like someone give me some food or steak very, very quickly to kind of balance me out. But it is a wine that really pairs very well with fuller seasoned cuisine, meats with fat, ribs, red meat, um, maybe duck or game and things like that. This might not be the red that I pull off the shelf when I'm trying to pair a red with a, you know, a salad with kind of maybe like a citrus or a dressing with some vinegar and things like that. I think there are better wines if you're a red wine drinker with kind of lighter foods. I think there are better wines for that. And this is just, again, kind of an unbridled, ripe, fruit-driven wine that Anybody who likes wines from warmer climates, whether they be California or Australia or really kind of within the Mediterranean, is really going to respond very well to this wine, uh, its richness, its softness, and its fruit profile. So that's a little bit about the Cibolo Monastrel from Humilla in Spain. We're going to transition to our white and sparkling wine. Let me give, my, uh, give myself a little, a little rinse a here. And this is another, actually, uh, wine, uh, another blended wine. If you remember that Toscana Rosso was also a blend of the two grapes. And this is another wine that's blended between Chardonnay and Viognier right here. Chardonnay is a grape that's grown all over the world. We've probably all heard of Chardonnay. Uh, if you haven't, it's a grape that grows everywhere. It's fairly healthy, easy to grow yields healthy uh, amounts of fruit for farmers. And on its own, Chardonnay is a fairly neutral varietal. And what does it mean by a neutral varietal? What is it talking about, right? A neutral varietal means in wine speak that you're not dealing with a grape that is overly aromatic or overly flavorful on its own. And it's one of the reasons that you'll see Chardonnay go into oak barrel so often. One, it likes it. And two, it adds a little bit of flavor to this fairly neutral grape. It's not overly floral or overly citric. You know, Sauvignon Blanc is going to jump out of the glass with these kind of citric and kind of green aromas or, or passion fruit aromas and things like that. Um, if anybody out there drinks uh, Riesling or Gewürztraminer or very aromatic varietals like that, that are super floral or jump out of the glass, Chardonnay is not like that. However, Viognier is more like that. And Viognier has flavors and aromas of stone fruits, apricot, peaches, some white flowers and things like that. Viognier is not grown um, in large quantities around the world, although you do see it uh, throughout certain areas of France, a little bit in Australia, a little bit in California. There is a small appellation in the northern Rhone Valley called Condrieu, which is um, dedicated entirely to the production of white wine made from the Viognier grape. So if you're really, if this is resonating with you and you want to give it a shot on its own, that would be a reference point for single varietal uh, Viognier. But it's a little bit on its own. It can be a, a, a pretty, um, it's, it's, it's an opinion. It has strong opinions. It's round. It's luscious. 
Um, it does not offer you on its own that kind of like crisp, racy, refreshing profile that a lot of people like from white wine. Uh, so on its own, it really just has a, uh, a very distinct point of view. One of the reasons I love it in this wine, this wine is about 50-50 Chardonnay and Viognier. Uh, it's done very well for us on site for, for a number of years. We also have another blended wine from Maspaillet, Cabernet, and Merlot. So they're very good at the art of blending here. And if you give it a sniff, you'll you'll immediately kind of, you'll be able to kind of get in there. There's a little bit kind of apricot or peach or maybe some pink bubble gum it reminds me of a particular kind of a bubble gum that i used to eat as a kid uh bubble tape came in these little kind of round uh plastic pink containers but there's a little bit more of that in here than there would be for sure if the chardonnay was left on its own however it's not as overbearing as if it was entirely a viognier so the chardonnay kind of like calms that Viognier down and the Viognier gives the Chardonnay a little bit more personality to stand on its own. This, this wine is just really super delicious. Um, it's so, so, so easy to drink, so well balanced. Um, I'm so glad for that Viognier in there, giving it a little bit of extra flavor. Uh, I'm so glad for that Chardonnay in there leveling out the characteristics of the Viognier and give it a give it a little bit of, of a little bit more of a kind of a, a texture, a, a dry, balanced uh, texture on the palate. Um, it's not too weighty and it's not too lean. It's really kind of a Goldilocks blend of these two grapes. And this is an area in southern France where I think the Chardonnay really benefits from just a little bit more ripeness. The Viognier benefits from being grown in an environment where it can achieve the type of ripeness that the winemaker wants. Um, and it also is grown in an area of Southern France where because of the climate, you have a warm, sunny, dry climate during the growing season with some nice breezes. So for that reason, it's fairly easy to grow things organically. They don't have to use any really pesticides or herbicides or nasty fungicides or anything like that at this estate. So you can feel good about what you're drinking in terms of everything grown organically without any of those nasty chemicals. Um, and it's just a really, really delightful white wine that I, I can't think of an instance where uh, this would be an unwelcome white wine, whether it be general thirst or or pairing with all sorts of food, um, white meat, poultry, chicken, um, younger, you know, sat dinner salads with some younger cheeses and nuts and things like that come to mind. And um, just really, really a dynamite wine. And I, I, I really hope everyone enjoys that. And our final wine is a cava. And we'll lift this up a little bit here. Gran Amigo Brut. And I'd like to take a minute to define and just clarify exactly what Brut means and what Kava means. So Kava is a regulated term which stipulates that the wine is made in almost exactly the same way as Champagne, just from a different region, right? Champagne is a protected term like Parmigiano Reggiano, or something like that, where the borders of a region, you can only make that thing from that place and call it that. It is protected. It is trademarked. However, you can make sparkling wine in the same method and techniques all over the world. They do it in California. They do it in South Africa. They do it all over France. They do it in Spain. And cava is Spain's Methodo Classico, Methodo Classico or Method Champenoise calling card and answer to the great wines of Champagne. It's made almost exactly in the same way. There are legal aging requirements which are very similar to Champagne. The major difference here is that you have different grapes and the grapes here are listed on the back of the bottle. You'll see Pariata, Chirello, Macabeo, and then Chardonnay. Chardonnay is one of the big three in Champagne. But in Spain, you're really talking about wines that are based on those other three first grapes that I mentioned. And interestingly enough, Cava is actually not even a regular, most of it is made up by in, in the Northeast by Barcelona, but you can actually make Cava all over Spain and call it Cava. It's more of a technique than an actual place, while Champagne is a technique and a place. In any event, that's what Cava is. That's what it means. It is wine made in exactly the same method as champagne, just from a different country with different grapes. Okay, now let's talk about the word brut, which is very interesting. 
Here we go. The word brute means dry. However, there is a broad spectrum of acceptability when it comes to the amount of sugar in something that calls itself brute. In so much as when a wine is labeled as brute, it is probably the sweetest wine you are drinking in a given meal or at a given point in time, because you can actually have between zero and 12 grams per liter in something that says brute on it, which is crazy. Um, most table wines that you drink are gonna be closer to zero. Maybe they have three or four grams of residual sugar to soften it out and you'll never know it's in there. But most champagne and sparkling wine labeled as brute is probably going to have somewhere between four and eight grams per liter. Once you get above eight, it starts to really, you can really kind of taste the sugar that's in there. Once you get below four, it gets a little bit kind of lean, mean and austere. And the reason there is a little bit of sugar left in wines that are made that are sparkling is that they are very acidic. Um, and in order to mitigate that acidity, there's a little bit of sugar in there to balance it out, right? It's why we put sugar in our margaritas or why we like whiskey sours or why there's a, a boatload of sugar in a can of soda, which is acidic enough to dissolve a straw made of petroleum if you leave it in there long enough, right? We like sour and sweet put together. It's just the way our palates have evolved. But if you took a little bit of that residual sugar out of your sparkling wine, all of a sudden it's going to get a little bit on the, or a lot on the lean, austere and unpleasant side. So that's a little bit about Cava and that's a little bit about Brut. Now the Gran Amigo made entirely from organic grapes, which is great because you really don't see that that often, especially in Champagne because of the climate. It's a little easier to do that in Spain because it's a little warmer and drier and sunnier. And you have, in addition to this kind of like bright freshness you have a little bit almost kind of like a, like a little brioche or Parker House roll or or kind of freshly sliced bread element to this wine that's mixed in with what I get kind of green apples and pears. And, and that is something that is directly linked to the wine making style of the champagne method. And in the champagne method, without getting too technical, because we just want to kind of hang and taste our taste our kava and have a good time without getting too technical there are two fermentations when you make this style of sparkling wine there's the first one where you make that acidic kind of base wine and then there's a secondary fermentation that actually takes place in the bottle you put kind of like a crown cap or a soda cap on it and you let a secondary fermentation take place in the bottle and as that yeast which is chomping on that sugar and fermenting the wine in here eats all the sugar, it produces carbon dioxide, which is capped, right? So the carbon dioxide goes into your wine, which creates the carbonation, creates the bubbles, and then it runs out of food. And then it just kind of, um, kind of dies and settles to the bottom. And there are many um, laws uh, which require certain aging, depending on if you put Brut, uh, Reserva, Grand Reserva for Cava, or a vintage dated or anything like that. But those dead yeast cells before the wine is finished and cleaned up are in contact with the wine. And it's no surprise that you get these kind of, this really so, smells like a delicious warm Parker House roll a little bit to me. Um, these kind of bready aromas mixed in with your sparkling wine. So it's a little bit about Cava, a little bit about Brut, and a little bit about the organically grown Gran Amigo. Mm. And it has really kind of a, a really great balance, a really great dry brute balance. Uh, that that extra complexity, I think you could you could certainly drink this throughout dinner. Um, then again, you could just open it when you're thirsty or when you're having friends over, when you're celebrating. It's has a nice balance to it that doesn't come off too dry or too austere or too lean. So you can really kind of kind of crush it a little bit to be perfectly honest. So um, so that is our winter bundle, six delicious wines each with kind of a unique point of view and uh, a little story behind it. So I hope everybody has a wonderful end to the year and uh, happy drinking. And I look forward to seeing you in a little bit with a spring bundle or something else soon. Ciao.